When women have orgasms from cervical self-stimulation, they describe it in much more vague terms, cosmic terms like, uh, you know, expanding the universe or a shower of stars because there's less feedback in experience from cervical stimulation than there is from, say, clitoral stimulation. Well, which those is, nerves hit different places. They hit different places and they go to different, slightly different places in the brain. And then other things that we found is that uh, stimulating the nipples, mm -hmm. self-stimulation of the nipples, activates the same cluster of cells in the, in, in the sensory part of the brain, the sensory cortex, as does the clitoris, cer clitoris, vagina, and cervix. So the nipples alone or the nipples in combination? The nipples alone do it, Okay. but they add to the, to the genital stimulation. Welcome back to the Rena Malik MD podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, I had the honor of interviewing Dr. Barry Komisorek. He is a distinguished professor of psychology at Rutgers University. He has dedicated his life's work to better understanding the neural mechanisms for orgasm, doing a multitude of studies and having now over 200 peer-reviewed published articles that relate to female sexual function. Today, we talked about what happens to the brain during orgasm. Does it differ between men and women? What areas of the body can be stimulated to produce orgasm and why you have non-genital orgasms, meaning stimulating areas outside of the genitals that can result in orgasm. We discussed how the cervix is sensate and procedures on the cervix can result in pain and sometimes stimulation of the cervix can lead to orgasm and a different sort of sensation of orgasm than what you get through clitoral or vaginal stimulation. We hope you enjoy. Dr. Kamasarek, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I'm really excited you, about Rena. this interview. Um, you are just a wealth of information. You have dedicated your life to learning more about women's sexual health. And we are so, so grateful. I love reading your work. I find it so informative and so helpful. Oh, thank you. Um, so tell me, you've done a lot of work in, for people who don't know, a lot of work in the female orgasm. So what happens in the brain and the nervous system with orgasm? Basically, what happens is that the entire brain becomes activated during orgasm to more or less extent. And um, it's, it's just an overall activation everywhere in the brain. It's a very, very intense experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, gradually we, different regions become more and more active, some more than others. And uh, it's just a, it's a climax of activity. You know, when you look at, you know, uh, the way we analyze it is with a, a, a color, a hot metal analog, and, you know, white hot is the hottest, and dark red is, is when it just starts to glow, and it's everything in between, you know, light red and the orange, and then yellow and white hot. And the whole, essentially, the whole brain goes white hot when at orgasm, and then it cools down again. So, to understand how, how it contributes, you know, we have to do basically reverse engineering, which means we know the kinds of physiological responses that occur at orgasm, such as uh, release of uh, oxytocin and um, increase in blood pressure and heart rate. And uh, so what part, we know what parts of the brain control each of those. Mm -hmm. And during orgasm, we see that they become particularly activated which makes sense uh, and then you know the uh, uh, if the orgasm is a result of uh, vaginal stimulation then uh, we know that uh, a region of the brain called the insula responds to um, particularly responds to uh, internal stimulation vaginal stimulation is internal we see that strongly activated so it's that kind of it's that kind of thing. Then we find other other regions, but uh, actually, what I've come to realize most recently is that uh, the regions of the brain that are most strongly activated by orgasm, you know, because while every every region becomes activated, um, the essentially every region becomes activated. Um, 
some more than others and if we if we have a a, a high uh, cutoff we can get the peaks mm -hmm. of some regions mm -hmm. and what we find uh, which is unusual is that or surprising is that those peaks are the same brain regions that are also activated classically by pain and what we found early that got me into this area was that when women apply vaginal self-stimulation and they uh, uh, apply the stimulation and they get more and more uh, uh, excited as we measuring how sensitive they are to pain by by uh, calibrated force on the finger asking them when when they uh, tell us when it hurts and then we stop the stop the thing and go to the next finger start over again um so we we, we plot the the pain threshold uh, and that is you know uh, the threshold is the point at which the force gets so intense that it hurts they say it hurts and then we stop and start over again on another finger uh, so what we find is that the more aroused the women get uh, the the higher the pain threshold goes in other words the more aroused they are and then it reaches a peak at orgasm mm -hmm. when they become least sensitive to pain at orgasm so the fact that orgasm activates the same parts in the brain as the pain pathway as as pain um but we also know that each of those brain regions maybe a dozen or so brain regions each of those has inhibitory uh neurons in in them it's like a sandwich uh where the inhibitory neurons are the filling of the sandwich and the 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 uh sexual pathway is one and the pain pathway is the other slice of bread got it and it's like a sandwich so obviously you know people who are in pain they they don't have orgasms it inhibits the orgasm but orgasms inhibit pain so it's a mutual uh they they can inhibit each other and it's also you known this interesting an interesting study that was published years ago people who had damage to the um, men and women who had damage to the spinal cord in the re in the uh, cutting the tract that uh, carries sensation of pain when that tract was cut those people lost the ability to have orgasm so they lost the ability to have pain below the level of the injury in the spinal cord and they also lost the ability to have orgasms wow but the the, the touch pathway is intact and they could feel their genitals they used uh vibrators on the genitals men and women they could feel the intense uh stimulation of the genitals but they couldn't have orgasms so they, it didn't they, they could feel it but it they the the feeling was not uh appropriate to give them orgasms so that's further evidence that there's some uh inherent interaction between the pain system and the orgasm system and this is something that i've just come to realize relatively recently we have a couple of papers on that um but nobody's pointed that out before nobody you know we don't have any concept for that but it's probably something about uh the the ability of both to um activate uh powerful arousal mm -hmm. And not just the touch but it's something about arousal that's beyond touch i mean there is obviously communities that uh, enjoy or people that enjoy pain right with well sexual you know that's a big question right uh, and and i've discussed it with a number of people and you know pain it's a peculiar uh perception because if you're in control of the pain and you can turn it off if it gets too aversive yeah then in some ways it can be very exciting i right. mean and people obviously the uh you know arnold schwarzenegger says uh 
uh, no gain without the pain, you know, but you know, <laughs> if you want to build your muscles, yeah, you have to go to the point of inducing pain and that grows the muscles mm -hmm. or, or, uh, uh, you know, running, uh, running, uh, race and which, uh, you know, a marathon where it's painful, but people do it for the gain, right? whatever for the, for the pleasure of winning or whatever mm -hmm. whatever floats their boat right so but and that may be what happens in the case of uh, bdsm mm -hmm. that they have a safe word so you know if the pain gets too much uh if it becomes aversive they say that's enough and so they're in control of it in other words right so if you're in control of the pain that makes it tolerable and also very around it can be very arousing right. depending on the context so if you know that may be what bdsm is they're doing it for the arousal and for the human interaction and you know all, all kinds of the issues about that. all kinds yeah. of psychological issues about it but um and the consent so they're they're preparing they're prepared for it right you know all these things change it from uh something like um you know uncontrolled pain like cancer pain right which is out of control yeah when was the last time a doctor spent an hour with you and truly focused on your goals and when was the last time you left feeling like you really understood what was going on with your body and had a clear plan of what was going to happen next at my practice, Rena Malik, MD, I aim to do just that. I specialize in sexual dysfunction, bladder health, hormone health, and pelvic pain for all people. And I want to revolutionize how we take care of patients. I want to really get to know each and every one of you. That's why at my practice, when you come to see me, I'm 100% present with you for an entire hour. And after you leave, if you forgot to ask me something or need clarification on something we talked about, don't worry. I'll respond to your issues and questions quickly through our secure messaging portal without any additional costs. Just go to www.renamalikmd.com slash appointments and schedule your visit today. We see patients in Irvine and Beverly Hills, California, and virtually for patients from California, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia. If you aren't located in these states, consider making an educational visit where we can talk about your conditions generally, but I can't diagnose or treat you. I can't wait to see you. Is it always that if you have chronic severe pain above some threshold that you can't orgasm or can you well can you induce orgasm to reduce pain? Yes. That's that's true also. Yeah. So yeah, uh, all of the above. <laughs> so it's sort of yeah, figuring it out. It can that. inhibit. Yeah, pain can can uh, you know, not an idea I have a headache. Yeah. You know, it can uh, uh and you know, make it unpleasant to even contemplate sexual stimulation on the other hand uh many women have told me that they use genital stimulation and orgasm to control and to uh, attenuate and inhibit turn off um menstrual cramps yeah and even headache and even uh back and leg pain so uh people women do use orgasm to inhibit pain they've sh they've known this yeah. a lot longer than um than we've been studying it. <laughs> <laughs> well you know i think people are always looking for natural remedies i mean this is one completely natural that's right <laughs> so you you mentioned that they're doing vaginal stimulation are they doing clitoral stimulation yeah. as well yeah okay well vaginal uh vaginal stimulation is a much more potent way of eliciting the pain blockage okay especially pressing on the anterior wall of the vagina because the anterior wall uh, that is the bar the part closest to the belly as opposed to the back or the sides mm -hmm. uh the the unique as the unique part uh the the unique element of of anterior vaginal stimulation is that it's not only pressing against the vaginal wall which can be pleasurable but it presses against the prostate women have a prostate uh, it presses against the urethra and some women enjoy urethral stimulation you know putting a, a 
some a bobby pin in the don't urethra. Don't do a bobby pin, please. Don't use do a, it. But yeah, they, use a flared something or, with a flared base. Something, <laughs> something. Yeah. Mechanical stimulation of the urethra. Uh, so uh, it's it's stimulating not only the the it's it's stimulating another several different uh, pleasure producing uh, regions. Yeah. Uh, organs. And that area, the, the female prostate or skein's gland, is the erogenous zone or the G spot, which is colloquial. Called. Well, that's it's we call it the G zone. The G zone. But because people know it as because it's not just a spot right. and it's not an anatomical entity. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a it's a it's a uh, concatenation of the the vaginal wall and the prostate and the urethra and uh, and and stimulating each of those is is pleasurable and uh com the combination is more pleasurable and we've that's that's been demonstrated that maybe people should know this uh because i make a point of it that um clitoral stimulation has been described as as producing a localized external kind of orgasm mm -hmm. that is uh eliciting orgasm from clitoral stimulation Yes. It's not a clitoral orgasm. It's a clitorally yes. elicited orgasm. Correct. And vaginal stimulated orgasm um, is has been described as more internal and uh, deep and heaving because the nerves that carry sensation from the vagina are uh, internal or visceral nerves, whereas the uh, pudendal nerve is the, the carries the sensation from the clitoris, which is external. Mm-hmm. And another internal nerve is from uh, the cervix, and that that's the, the hypogastric nerve and also the vagus nerve. And those have an even different sensation. When women have orgasms from cervical self-stimulation, they describe it in much more vague terms, cosmic terms, like, uh, you know, expanding the universe or a shower of stars, because there's less um feedback in experience from cervical stimulation than there is from say clitoral stimulation well which those is, nerves hit different places they hit different places yeah and they go to different slightly different places in the brain we've also seen that but they all go to the same general region and other women have described that if they stimulate uh the the clitoris and the vagina and the cervix it activates and we see that that activates more neuron more nerve cells in the in this in the brain uh each of which can produce orgasm so when you put them all together it produces a much stronger orgasm and then other things that we found is that uh stimulating the nipples mm -hmm. self-stimulation of the nipples activates the same cluster of cells in the in in the sensory part of the brain the sensory cortex as does the clitoris Cer clitoris, vagina, and cervix. So the nipples alone or the nipples in combination? The nipples alone do it. Okay. But they add to the to the genital stimulation. And that's why, you know, uh as I, I told the audience, uh, you know, when I when I when I just I found that there's a classical map of the body called the, the Penfield homunculus, which means a little person in the in the brain. We'll show a picture on the video. Okay. On uh, the sensory cortex. Yeah. There's a strip of tissue that 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 how he did that is another heroic study yeah I imagine. because he was a neuro he was a neuro uh surgeon at uh university of montreal mm -hmm. and um he uh he was a, a epilepsy uh, uh specialist and he did uh he he, he would map the he would want to know where the epilepsy is starting from but and and remove that focus of, of epileptic ab abnormal activity in the brain but to get to it he had to go through the brain other parts of the brain so he wanted to make sure he didn't d damage critical parts of the brain in getting to the to the uh, or uh, the epileptic focus so what he did was he, he wanted to ask people so in order to do that what he did was he anesthetized, gave local anesthesia to the scalp, okay, and cut off, cut the, the scalp off. Oh my gosh! In, in awake people, these are awake, wow. awake patients. Okay. So he he cut he removed the scalp, uh huh, 
the, the, the skin, the hair in the skin. And then he injected the bone with anesthesia, local anesthesia all the way around and then sawed off the top of the skull. While they're awake. While they're awake. Wow. And then it exposed the, exposed the brain. And then with a little handheld electrode, he went and stimulated different regions by hand of this strip of, of uh, sensory cortex, which is like, it's right over the top of the, uh, right over the top of the head from ear, from the top of each ear. That's where the sensory cortex is. And it's like if you're wearing earmuffs, that's where the band, it's about the size of the band of, of, of the earmuffs. Yeah. And it's, it's exactly under where the band would be if you're wearing it on top of the head. Mm -hmm. um, so he, if he, if he stimulated uh, one part of, the, of, of that band of tissue, the people said, oh, it feels like you're touching my thumb. Mm -hmm. And they moved a little bit. He said, it feels like you're touching my first finger. And then a little bit more, he said, oh, it's, it's, it feels like you're touching my pinky. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he moved to the other direction, um, and it feels like you're touching my face. That's what the people would report as he's doing this. They're awake. That's crazy. And he ma so he mapped the whole body. And he also had to go de deep into the midline where the two hemispheres mat meet. Mm -hmm. They're not connected, but they meet. And in that region... Uh, that's where uh, the uh, they said it, it feels like you're touching my my genitals mm -hmm. or my feet. The the feet and the genitals are right next to each other in that region. Yeah, and the nipples are close by, right? Well, no, the nipples the cl the the classic picture on this homunculus is that the nipples are on the chest region yeah. of the map, okay, which is you know over the top and on the side a little bit. Uh huh. But what we're seeing is that. While that's true, it is we do see activation of that region uh -huh. with the nipple st self stimulation. We also see the activation right in the region where the genitals project, the clitoris, vagina, and cervix. And when you know my my male uh, neuroscience colleagues say that's you know that we have to change the map, and my the my women neuroscience colleagues say yeah. <laughs> They've known it all along of course, that yeah. it feels erotic. Yeah, you know. So anyway, again, you know, I'm rediscovering what women have known all along. But yeah, you're just writing it in. Just writing it up, you know. <laughs> um, maybe they've been too embarrassed to talk about it or something, or in general, or publish it because this has not been published before. Well, it's it's probably been in mainstream media and like Cosmo magazine and maybe, like you know, like maybe. they've talked about it. They talk about it, Rogers, but but not to not to know that it actually activates the same. the same population of neurons as yeah. the genitals no just that it's an erogenous zone it's just an erogenous but that you know what does that mean yeah. but to say that it's it's really activating the same neurons that the uh, clitoris or the vagina or the cervix activates that's why um, so the implication of that is that since combining clitoris and vaginal and cervical stimulation will produce a more intense more complicated or more complex and more pleasurable, more intense orgasm, because you just pop, you're just activating different groups of nerve cells, each of which can produce an orgasm of different quality, but then you combine them and it produces, it add, it's additive. Mm -hmm. And then you add the nipple stimulation, and that's even uh, more, more add, more, more, more additive. Yeah. And then we also found that, um, uh, two other regions um, also activate the same the same part of the brain mm -hmm. as the genitals, and that is a little a little strange. But it's the um, stimulating a, a like just over the ear where the uh, ear canal enters, just above that. Huh. There's a branch of the vagus nerve that carries sensation from there, and it goes right to the genital sensory cortex. Wow. Huh. <laughs> uh, so that may be another area um, of adding to the others, yes. the activity of the others. And the other thing is a lot of people say that toe stimulation mm -hmm. is erotic, feels erotic, and that goes to the same region also. Fascinating. So it could be a way of either helping to have uh, helping to elicit orgasms in women 
who have trouble having orgasms mm -hmm. or it could intensify orgasms in women who don't have trouble having orgasms and just make it more more interesting and so you're seeing the pattern on the the thresholds on the brain map be higher in terms of like how hot they get well we haven't actually we haven't studied the uh intentionally the combination we haven't studied the the what happens in the orgasms when you add all these together okay uh we haven't done that yet it's an interesting interesting point i mean it uh but uh just in terms of a strategy but the other important thing is to realize that in order to get the in order to have an orgasm it, the, the you, you have to have the right rhythm of stimulation you know it's sort of like if you think about uh pushing on a swing mm -hmm. uh you know depending on you you can push on the swing in a way that you know push it rhythmically in terms of its if its own resonant frequency, you know, when uh, when it comes back to you and starts going in the same direction again, you give it another shove and it goes higher yeah. and higher and higher. If you're at that rhythm, but if you're out of the rhythm, when it comes back to you, if you hit it too, if you push on it too too soon, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually stop it. So the rhythm of stimulation is is important, and that you know. Um, I think that that's something that people may not appreciate. Yeah. You know, like if you start with uh, just uh, uh, vaginal penetration mm -hmm. without getting the, 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 the swing going, <clears throat> or another, another metaphor of that is <clears throat> trying to um, say you have a, a, a bathtub half full of water mm -hmm. and uh, orgasm would be sloshing uh the water over the over the rim yeah in order to do that you have to push on you push down on the water let it come back up you push down again if you get the right rhythm you get it sloshing back and forth you have to learn what the rhythm is uh to get to optimize the sloshing and then you know you can get it to slosh over the top but if you do it at, at, in the wrong rhythm or you're not paying attention to the rhythm uh it doesn't go anywhere is the rhythm unique to the individual it's unique to the individual mm -hmm. or even to the circumstance you know there could be different rhythm at different times depending on other factors right so the critical thing is either self-stimulation appropriately or uh, you know communicating with the partner to get the rhythm right and you know um a lot of women find it much easier to have a, an orgasm from clitoral mm -hmm. stimulation than from vaginal stimulation or cervical stimulation. So maybe you got to get the momentum going with the clitoral stimulation first, yeah, and then then start the vaginal stimulation, and then even the, add the clitoral stimulate uh, the uh, cervical stimulation to get the the once the momentum is going, it's like start like. Well, if people know about a uh, manual transmission in a car, mm -hmm. you know, you start in first gear, then you shift to second as the as the momentum pick up as you pick up speed. So the the engine goes a little slower, but you have the momentum going, uh, and then you go into third gear and fourth gear, five, fifth, sixth, like that. You can start the car in third gear or fourth gear. Theoretically, you can do it. It just it's but it's it you're not uh, taking advantage of the torque that you can get starting in first you know? so you could still get an orgasm but it may not be as impactful yeah or may not you, you may, you may not be able to get it yeah so it, it's really and it's all individual preferences yeah so you you have communication between partners is crucial are you loving the Rena Malik MD podcast well i love each and every one of you and i'm truly honored that you choose to spend a bit of your day or a bit of your week with me. Did you ever hear the actual story of why I started making content online? Well, when I was a resident, I remember having a patient who had bladder cancer. And in order to treat her bladder cancer, we had to remove it and then reconstruct a new bladder called an Indiana pouch. Now with this new bladder, she would have to catheterize herself through a stoma or an opening on her abdomen in order to empty her bladder. So after surgery, immediately she did great. She went home and no major issues. 
But subsequently, over the next couple months, she started getting readmitted over and over again to the intensive care unit. And we were really wondering what was going on. Eventually, we figured out that she didn't truly understand that she now had to catheterize herself to empty her bladder. Just the simplest thing that was so pivotal, she didn't understand that. And it was then that I realized as a urologist, I could do the perfect surgery. But if my patient didn't understand the consequences of that surgery, then I failed as their doctor. And once I started practice, I realized that I couldn't teach people everything they needed to know in the 15 or 30 minutes I saw them in my office. And that's when I started creating all my Rena Malik MD content to offer free education to people around the world. And I can tell you that it has been truly one of the most rewarding experiences in my life. And in order to keep providing free content, we need your help. If you are getting value out of this podcast or my other content, I encourage you to join our premium membership. As a member, you'll get early access to the audio and video of the podcast completely ad-free, transcripts of all the episodes, and exclusive access to Ask Me Anything episodes that occur once a month. And during those episodes, I answer questions that are asked only by premium members. So join us today at renamalik.supercast.com. Can't wait to see you there. So, you know, we talked a little bit, I guess. We touched on non-genital orgasms, but... Oh, that that's a whole other... We touched on the other par- non-genital parts that may contribute to non-genital orgasms, yeah. but maybe you could talk a little bit. I know you've done research on that. You know, for in the literature, in all kinds of different literature, people have basically described that they can... Ha- they can experience an orgasm from stimulating virtually every part of the body. Uh, well, breast, or- breast stimulation is, is probably the most common non-genital region, but we see that that could be, we could have a, a rational reason for that. Right. Uh, but an ear stimulation, uh, toe stimulation, but people say uh, hand stimulation or, or basically or, or lip stimulation, uh, or uh, any basically any part of the body can elicit an orgasm. But I think what it is is that uh, an orgasm is a buildup of tension, muscular tension, yeah, uh, up to a point of uh, of re- release. Like um, I've I've said that a sneeze is an orgasm in the respiratory system. And uh, a yawn is an orgasm in the respiratory system, mm-hmm. and and a stretch when you stretch and you <clears throat> ah like that, and then you relax. So each of those, there's a you reach a peak of uh, muscular contraction intensity, and you release it, and that is actually uh, there's a physiological term for that. It's the a protective reflex mm-hmm. where when you reach uh, an intensi- a high intensity for a particular muscle, th- there's an automatic uh, s- system, a new system that kicks in that uh, only fires when the tension on the muscle is very, very high, and that when there's a risk of being of, of damage, and it kicks in uh, a new inhibitory set of nerve cells that turn it off suddenly turn off the the uh the muscle contraction yeah so it's like uh and it's a protective reflex uh for example if you're uh have your your hand your your have your hands out um with your biceps flexed uh, expecting somebody to drop a, a bag of feathers into your into your hands and it turns out to be a bag of bricks mm-hmm. then uh you weren't prepared for that and the sudden intense ch- stretch on the biceps of uh, tendon uh, that attaches the muscle to the bone uh, triggers a, a pathway from the from the tendon. It's called the Golgi tendon organ mm-hmm. reflex that activates suddenly activates um, s- strong inhibitory neurons that turn off the activity of the biceps so suddenly you drop it yeah to and protect you drop, yourself. it it's a protective reflex 
and we perceive that as as you know the pain uh, just at the point of pain but it's protecting us against the pain and it's also preventing the the muscle from being damaged of, uh, or the tendon from being ripped out of the bone or out of ripped out of the muscle right so people can perceive these as we, pleasurable. Perceive it. And that's as pleasurable because it gets to an intense part and then it, it turns off. And so that's probably what's happening in all these other regions of the body that the tension builds up and then it, it relaxes. And that's pleasurable. That gives it gives so you a climax. that's why people may have that's why, pegasms, like, you've heard of that, right? Like... Like the sensation of orgasms when they have a very full bladder and they urinate, and you and you release that, yeah. or, or, or defecation. Yeah. Oh, uh, um, you know, or, these are all different kinds of non-genital orgasm, and you know, while I realize that it's it's uh, kind of a pathetic when it's when the my most popular, my most read article. I published something like uh, uh, almost 200 articles yeah. and another 200 abstracts of presentations of conferences. Uh, the one paper that is most widely read uh, is uh, about not, is non-genital orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> and and I have read it too. <laughs> and it, oh, and the, I mean, I have you know, for me, you know, where it normally, you know, as a scientific paper, if you get a uh, hundred reads, that's that's really pretty good. Yeah. Uh, if, if if you have uh, a really high score for people uh, in science. Uh, it's called the H index, mm -hmm. and people actually get promoted on the basis of it. Yeah, and uh, it, it's like a good score is twenty five or thirty. Yeah, and that means that you have um, at least thirty paper. If you have a score of thirty, if you have uh, um, thirty papers that you've published that have been cited at least thirty times, yeah, then you have that's <laughs> that's it. So it's a number of articles that you've published that are cited in that number of times. So, you know, 30 citations for, for the internet, it's nothing. Right. But, so my my um, highest uh, cited publication is this non-genital paper, and I've I, now I have about 40,000 citations, 40,000 citations of it, <laughs> which, which, you know, that's, that's my peak. <laughs> you probably you have a million hits or something. <laughs> You know, yeah, there's nowhere nowhere near it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so it's a different do different think, scale. Do you think people can train themselves? This, this question comes up a lot. Sure. Do you think people can train themselves Absolutely. to feel well, pleasure? Sure. Yeah. I think so. Why not? Yeah. Interesting. I do it myself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, men and women, the differences in terms of orgasm. Yeah. Is it is it different oh, in the brain pathways? You yeah that's that's. That's something that we're studying right now because we've done we've done um, uh, analyzed brain activity in, uh, during orgasm in women, mm -hmm. and we've done the same thing uh, brain activity during orgasm in men, mm -hmm. and uh, so we've done both sets, and just eyeballing it, uh, what it looks like uh, during orgasm the similarities in brain regions activated are uh, almost the same. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, uh, the, the similarities are much greater than any differences. The one big difference that we see is after orgasm, when, uh, uh, or at the end of orgasm, the activity goes way down in men, but it stays up in women. And that's probably because women ha can have multiple orgasms, and it's very difficult for men to have multiple orgasms. Yeah, like, we can under some circumstances, mm -hmm. um, you know, high arousal. Uh, but typically, it's you know it's over after the first orgasm for men, but women can can go on. So that's the big difference that it go the activity goes way down in men, but it doesn't go way down in women. It can continue. And most of these studies are done with self-stimulation, right? So we've done, yeah, we, but we've done some partner stimulation. You have. And okay. we've looked at the difference, and we don't see any difference. Um, in, of course, this is, you know, this is a, in the scanner. It's not a, it's not a very <laughs> romantic situation. The partner is standing outside the scanner, 
and stimulating the the woman's clitoris. Okay. We haven't done partner uh, woman stimulating men, but we've done uh, the male partner stimulating the woman. Um, so that's how we do that study. And now what we're there, there are ways there are electronic ways of doing it's called conjunction analysis and difference analysis, where you can take the male set and the female set of data and say what's similar about it and just focus on the on the exact similarities. Mm -hmm. That's the conjunction analysis. Yeah. And on the other hand, we you can analyze what's you subtract one from the other, what's different. Mm -hmm. So you can get a difference. We can figure out exactly what what's different about them, uh, and also exactly what is similar about it. So we're doing that right now. We're in in that process. Yeah, it's <clears throat> that's interesting because one, there's um, there's a clear ejaculation with men where we don't always see that with women, and that and I wonder if that plays a role. And two, there was a recent study where they saw that, you know, when you have um, ejaculation from masturbation versus orga versus partnered sex, that the prolactin level um, is significantly higher when it's with partnered sex. So I wonder if there's a similar corollary in, in brain activity. Well, I mean, the, the uh, mechanism for prolactin uh, release is a depletion of dopamine in the brain, mm -hmm. and we've we've shown that's another region that we we found uh, in our measurement of orgasm another another pair of regions uh, that is highly activated at orgasm <clears throat> is the dopamine pathway the origin where the where the nerve cells originate in a region called the, the midbrain, mm -hmm. and it projects to a region called the nucleus accumbens in the in the forebrain. Mm -hmm. And uh, those neurons uh, produce dopamine and they release it into the nucleus accumbens at orgasm. And um, dopamine is also known to endocrinologists as the prolactin inhibitory factor. Mm -hmm. PIF mm -hmm. because so since prolactin is released um, during orgasm it's most likely because the, the dopamine is re, is, is uh, released yeah at orgasm and it's depleted so there's no inhibition of prolactin so the prolactin goes up so it may be if the prolactin goes up higher after partner sex it may be that the partner sex activates the dopamine pathway more, depletes the dopamine more because the orgasm is more intense, and that's why the prolactin goes up more. Yeah. Do you think there's a difference in terms of orgasm and ejaculation in the brain? Like if you have an orgasm without an ejaculation. The interesting thing about ejaculation is that in order to, eja in order to trigger the ejaculatory mechanism, the ejaculatory mechanism is a high threshold mechanism. And what, me, what that means is that it takes intense stimulation, intense neuron stimulation to trigger ejaculation. It has a very high threshold of activation. So what that means is that the brain activity has to uh, build up to a high intensity that's sufficient to trigger that sudden ejaculation. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is a mechanism that um, requires, in order to get a high intensity of stimulation, it needs a high growing intensity of inhibition mm -hmm. to prevent the high intensity of, of uh, excitation from getting too averse and getting painful. Yeah. So you so there's a build up where the the inhib and we know this and mm -hmm. we see that that the the inhibition is building up enabling the uh the excitation to each to to reach a very high intensity which is sufficient to trigger it's sort of like the protective reflex it has to reach a certain intensity in order to trigger it's it's another it's like an extension of the protective reflex, which is a typical spinal reflex, a common spinal reflex, protective reflex. Mm -hmm. It's an extension into the brain 
yeah. of the protective reflex. And it triggers the, the it's, it's, a, it's a way of getting, enabling the brain to reach a high level of excitation that triggers this high threshold. Um, and it's, this, it's the uh, activation of the sympathetic division of the autonomic system. Which is uh, the the part that produces uh, adaptation to uh, stress? Yeah, increases heart rate, blood pressure, all that. So um, that's what triggers the ejaculation. So you can have an orgasm at at a lower intensity, and it's possible that women have an orgasm at a lower intensity that doesn't trigger the protective reflex. The in the male, the ejaculation triggers this protective reflex that turns the whole system off. And maybe that's why they go into this so-called refractory period. But the women don't have that. Uh, they don't have that inhibition that develops to turn the system off. They don't get that high. Maybe they don't. Well, we don't they know. Can get, you can get very, very high, but maybe it's it's in the men, you, you have to get a certain height to, I mean, you do have to get to a certain height to trigger that. You know, we don't walk, we don't walk around ejaculating all the time. <laughs> we have to get to a high level of excitation yeah. of a particular system in the brain that gets to the to the um, ejaculatory mechanism. Right. Um, and you know, women do. Uh, women ejaculate. They do. Uh, this, uh, you know, there's objective evidence that yep. the the fluid that women ejaculate. And that's a whole other issue. Yeah. Uh, they ejaculate the 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 chemical content of the uh, ejaculate in women is the same as in men. There's a, a, pro, a PSA, PSA. Mm -hmm. a prostatic uh, specific uh, antigen, a specific antigen, and also al um, acid phosphatase, mm -hmm. as opposed to the content of of urine, which is uh, urea and creatinine. Mm -hmm. It's not in the it's not in the Ejacul ejaculate. Yeah. So that's a way of different. That's been done. Yes. And it's clear that they that and and it's a relatively small volume. Right. In men and in women, the ejaculate. So women definitely ejaculate. Right. It's an interesting question as to whether, when women ejaculate, do they continue having multiple orgasms? Yeah, I don't know. Or is that the end? Yeah. Do they? Does that the? Uh, you know, I just never occurred to me. <laughs> Nobody never asked. I don't know. But it's an interesting question. I mean, it's what you're raising, um, and you know, if any of your uh, 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 listeners or watchers um, know, you know, does it make a difference in women, in the same woman? Because some women can ejaculate sometimes and not other times right. at orgasm. Does it make a difference uh, if they ejaculate? Do they still want to have multiple orgasms, or does that? stop multiple orgasms just I like wonder. in the men well i think the other complicating factor is that the ejaculate volume is very small but then there's also the squirting component that's a whole other and, thing but so i don't know that women would be able to differentiate themselves well no it's easy to it, it, it it's easy to differentiate because the the uh the at the true ejaculate is uh one or two teaspoonfuls yeah and it it it's a sticky fluid right it's like whitish as opposed to squirt now, squirting, there's a whole, I, I think the idea of squirting, there's, I feel it's a, there's a controversy there. There That's, is. <laughs> there, there's a built-in controversy that I don't think has been generally recognized. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm interested in maybe some of your listeners or watchers uh, have some uh, evidence about this. Um, and that is, I've spoken to a number of women, uh, healthcare providers who insist that the fluid that they release it does not smell like urine it does not taste like urine it's sweet that's what they said and they are sure that it's not urine yeah they know what urine is yeah and they cuz they can sometimes release urine uh during sexual stimulation they say this is not urine right and this is a study I'd like to do. And, you know, maybe if the women can contact you, let you know, <laughs> I'll do the study. We should do it. <laughs> we'll do it. Uh, we could do it collaboratively. <laughs> and uh, because, because it's possible, and, you know, I've heard not only that, but I, there was a, uh, an Egyptian uh, obstetrician who told me that 
he's sure that it's not urine. Well, the there food, was the, there was the one the study food. that the one like most popular. St- it was like a small study, but they looked at the the contents of urine it's like the contents of squirting and it's like dilute and clear and it do, i mean it does have some but, but where is it coming from that volume of fluid i well, guess that's the well, other thing uh you know some i mean one typical thing is it comes from the urethra right um and that that is very likely urine but other women are not sure it comes from the urethra and uh you know, a long time ago, before there were fancy chemical assays, there was um, a bioassay in rats, a bioassay for estrogen. Mm-hmm. If you take an unknown substance, you don't know if it has estrogen in it. So what they did was they injected they injected it into rats, and they they weighed the uterus and the vagina, and they said that uh, it's a they called it a water imbibition that the estrogen uh, has a unique effect of, of uh, stimulating accumulation of, of fluid in the vagina and, and uterus. And they weighed that as the assay, if an unknown substance increases the weight of the, of the uterus and vagina yeah. in a rat, that was the evidence of estrogen. So it's very likely that that's what uh, happens in women, in response to estrogen, uh-huh. that it uh, it's called water imbibition. It was called the estrogen water imbibition assay. Yeah, meaning that the the uh, vagina and, and uterus drinks the water. Right. So uh, maybe the same thing happens in women. And then, since the uterus and the vagina can contract mm-hmm. during orgasm, yeah, maybe it squeezes the accumulated water. That makes out. sense. That makes and a lot that, of sense. But nobody's done that yeah you know there's these questions i think people have it's very difficult to get funding because what is not clinically relevant right like it's well <laughs> don't worry about the funding because i i have i can i have the i then have we can funding. do it okay i have i have spare funding <laughs> All right. i'm willing to do that but, you know another way of doing collecting the the uh, the fluid to make sure that it's not urine is using a a a, 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 a menstrual cra- cap yeah yeah um, and collect, the you fluid. know, collect fluid. If they, if they, if the women say that they have, they squirt and they they're sure it's not urine. But that's the thing; they have to, they, they have, have to, to be sure. Themselves. They have to be sure because in the in the published papers, there are about uh, three or four published papers on right. squirting and the chemical content. They say you know it's dolly, but they don't they don't select, they don't say they just collect liquid, right? And they don't they don't say that this is this this sample comes from women who insist that this is not urine yeah and then analyze that fluid yeah because there was that one i think the more recent one is where they looked at bladder scans and they looked at like the amount of urine in the bladder and they measured and and, you know it's so hard to say and then people like it's urine like it was like okay well yeah sure (laughs) of course you know it's you know i'm sure that you know because uh there's so much um abdominal contraction muscle contraction and increasing pressure in the abdomen uh uh you know squeezing i mean this it's called the valsalva maneuver mm-hmm. you you know yeah. You, yeah. you squeeze and yeah. that's how you defecate and you, you could urinate that way increasing you in, you uh, tense the abdominal muscles it, it uh, puts pressure internally and it puts pressure on the bladder right so you squeeze the urine out yeah. So sure, during orgasm you do that, and so it can it, it can squeeze out urine. It's it's sure. perfectly natural. But women know but, generally. And women know, but but take the sample from women who say that this particular sample they have tested it. They know that it's not urine. Yeah. That's what I want to analyze. Yes, that's fascinating. Um, there's so much, so many questions that I think there that still could be answered. Uh, in terms of, yeah. um, we don't know, we don't know, <laughs> diddly. We don't know diddly. Yeah, really. And people want to know. People want. I, yeah, I, pe- people are very curious, and uh, it's just notoriously difficult to get funding. Yeah, it's, you know, for 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 grants. I mean, it's very it very very difficult because you know there's so much squeamishness. I know, I know. It's it's a shame. Um, I want to talk about anorgasmia, particularly in women, 
um, there's, you know, maybe 12% of women report they've never had an orgasm. Now, some of this could be inadequate stimulation. Some of this could be um, probably inadequate stimulation. What are your thoughts? Are there people who are truly anorgasmic and why? Well, that's probably really, really complex mm -hmm. because I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a powerful psychological component. Uh, you know, uh, uh, could be cultural inhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, God knows. Uh, uh, you know, if primary there's there's so-called primary or uh, anorgasmia and mm -hmm. secondary. Right. Primary is um, a woman who is adult and has never had an orgasm in her life. Right. And secondary is women who have had orgasms and then lose lose it. And um, so uh, that could be due to cultural, you know, a different partner mm -hmm. or some, some event that occurs. Um, you know, we really, we, do, we don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it hasn't been really studied. Mm -hmm. uh, my one, my colleague Nan Wise, who's a sex therapist, uh, says that that treating primary anorgasmia is a lot easier than treating secondary or anorgasmia. Yeah, um, because um, she can teach women to self stimulate mm -hmm. with a vibrator or other me methods. And gradually get them uh, to to self stimulate because it, that's uh, she thinks it's mainly cultural a cultural inhibition religious or cultural some or, so, or trauma uh, an early trauma yeah. uh, uh, so, things like that that she can psychologically deal with and have and and gradually have them learn how to um, elicit an, an orgasm. orgasm. Mm -hmm. uh, Secondary is more is more complicated because it could be there could be illness, decreased sensation, decreased uh, a clitoral, different partner, yeah, uh, you know, uh, illness like diabetes, yeah, or multiple sclerosis. Uh, it mm -hmm. could be many many problems or pain or clitoral adhesions or other things that affect the thing, clitoris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's more complicated. I remember I wanted to do a study on on brain activity during in, in a woman in women with anorgasmia. Mm -hmm. And um, there there was a woman who who said who volunteered. She said I've never had an orgasm in my life. Yeah. So I got IRB approval and you know I every I made all the arrangements to do the to the study and um and scheduled it and the night before we were supposed to do the scan she called me up she says sorry i i can't do it i said what happened she says um well i uh i have a new boyfriend and i had my first orgasm oh. last night <laughs> <laughs> well good for her good for her um i want to talk talk on um you know you've talked about cervical sensation and i think this is an important discussion because um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about cervix are insensate or they think that these procedures oh, yeah. should be done. You know, there's many procedures women get done without any anesthesia, right? IUDs, um, leap, like uh, biopsies, things like that, that um, can be quite painful. So yeah. let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, unfortunately, it's a belief among many um, gynecologists that, the the genital the, the vagina and cervix are insensate. Well, the vagina we know is sensate, at least the first. Well, but yeah. but a lot of doctors think that it's insensate, and there have been reports in the literature that it's that the you know don't worry because you can slice it and it, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt them a bit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's not what I learned. I don't know what med school they went to. <laughs> so um, and clearly. You know, when we when we had, I, I designed a stimulator that women could do clitoral. Well, they could do clitoral self stimulation. They could do vaginal self stimulation, and they could do cervical self stimulation differently. Mm -hmm. And that's how we mapped the sensory cortex of the different. And we see that it's different. It's different between 
um, the the uh, uh, clitoris and the vagina and the cervix, and mm -hmm. they do have cervical sensation. And um, there, there's publications showing that women have reported that they, that the cervical stimulation contributes to their orgasm. They can feel it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's a myth that I mean, it, it, you know, we we as as infants we teach ourselves, you know. Uh, we teach ourselves, say, to wiggle a finger. You can't mm -hmm. teach that to anybody because we we have random movements and we see what happens if we do random movements and we we have a correlation between what we see and what's happening and what we whatever it is what we have to know what 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 we do, you know. But it's it's really basically biofeedback because mm -hmm. biofeedback you're getting some signal and uh, you know do that again. Well, I don't know what I did. Well, yeah, but do it again, whatever you did. Yeah. And we teach ourselves that. We te and so we have that kind of, for the clitoris, it's outside the body. Right. So women have much more uh knowledge, feedback from, you know, sitting down and when they sit down, they can feel it. The uh, ride a bike, you can feel it when you touch it. You know you're touching it because you feel it in your hands. We don't they, they we don't have that kind of feedback for the cervix. It's it's not it's not easy to know when when th there's nothing to correlate with as readily as the external parts of the body. Yeah. So it's more vague. Yeah. Well, and the body and, the the body the vagina lengthens right to prepare for sex, and so some yeah. will never feel cervical stimulation if they have. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know that's right. It, the the penis may never reach the cervix, right? But if it does, they can feel it. And women say, you know, they said they feel it feels like a shower of stars when it, when the cervix when they is it touched, or it feels like uh, the co the universe expanding in my cosmos, and you know this very abstract kind of descriptions of that of of cervical stimulation as opposed to. Uh, you know, I feel I feel my clitoris. Yeah, um, and it feels good. That kind of thing. So, and in addition to that, another really uh, most convincing evidence to me is when we studied the women with spinal cord injury mm -hmm. who could not feel the external parts of their body because. The spine, spinal cord was cut. Mm -hmm. They couldn't feel uh, anything. They had no movement or, or no voluntary movement below the level of the injury. They had no sensation below the level of the injury. However, they did have vaginal and cervical sensation because and that's what we, one of the things that we found was that it was via the vagus nerve that goes outside the spinal cord uh, projecting directly into the brain, not traveling in the spinal cord. So it doesn't need the spinal cord. But what that means to me is that they could feel the stimulation even though they could not feel the clitoris. Yeah. So in other words, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's this uh, mis misunderstanding thinking that, well, if you do vaginal stimulation, it's really because you're stimulate, you're indirectly stimulating the, the clitoris. The, the, the clitoris. Mm -hmm. And that's another part of, you know, it's in the anterior wall of the vagina. So you're not only pressing on the vaginal wall, you're pressing on the clitoris and the prostate and the urethra, right. all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's why it feels good more because you not you don't do that if you st uh, stimulate the in the back of the of the vagina or the sides. It's just in the anterior region. Uh, so that's why we call it the G zone. Yeah. It's not a spot. It's not an anatomical spot. It's a just a bunch of erotogenic regions right and you press on it and you're stimulating all of them yeah you're, but what it means is that because they can't feel the clitoris because of the spinal cord injury but they do feel the vagina and the cervix it means there are definitely sense they can sense the vagina and cervical stimulation and it's not indirectly because they're stimulating the, the clitoris yeah that's I mean I mean that's important. It's important. It's important and, and you know, the fact that when you do that stimulation, it goes to parts of the brain different from when they stimulate the clitoris. That's other evidence that there is specific innervation by of I mean and, and there's anatomical evidence that the 
that the pelvic nerve and the and the hypogastric nerve and the vagus uh, innervate the internal organs in the vagina and the cervix. And if you cut those nerves, you know, if you do it, uh, you know, I've done this in in laboratory animals. Cut the nerves, you lose the you lose the effect of the stimulation. Yeah. I wonder, you know, I think though, I mean, it's it's a little bit complex. The zone is complex because there's obviously the the female prostate, but there's also the clitoral shaft, and then the the yeah. um, the clitoral crura right. and the clitoral bulbs are sure. lateral. So I think there is some sensation from the clitoris, even from yeah, the lateral. Sure. Right, yeah, sure. Normally, in in uh, able bodied women, right. Yeah, you stimulate the, you push on the vagina, you are stimulating the clitoris. Right. Indirectly. But you're saying in this case, they're feeling it from the, because there's no, they but can't feel they the clitoris. They can't, the, yeah. the, 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 the uh, nerve. They're not feeling the pudendal. The, right. the nerve, the pudendal nerve is carrying the sensation from the clitoris. And that goes into the spinal cord. If you right. cut that, it, you don't, you don't feel the, the clitoris. Right. But the vagus nerve carries sensation from the, uh, from the vagina and the cervix. And that's. And we see that in those women with the with the severed spinal cord, it activates the part of the brain that the vagus nerve projects to. Yeah. In in the in the medulla of the brainstem, and that's activated. We see that in the in the brain imaging. Yeah. So so, so you know it's <clears throat> clear evidence that the that the vagina and the cervix are definitely sensate. Yes. And it may be a question of lack of, of, of familiarity. We, you know, less, I mean, less, I mean, there's probably more familiarity with with vaginal stimulation or putting in tampons and things like that. Right. Even less, the cervix is even less familiar. Yeah. Get less information about it. Right. Cor right. To correlate with what we do, you know, knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if if the if the if you're getting the vaginal stimulation, then also you would assume prostate stimulation similarly would would potentially produce an orgasm in men. I have uh, some evidence in men with with uh, uh, severed spinal cord that they they don't have any genital sensation, but when they do a bowel program, right. stimulate the bowel to elicit defecation reflexively, uh, they can feel the prostate. Yeah. So it may be that the the vagus also innervates the prostate in men. So, but we just don't know that. Right. This, you know, there's more that we don't know. I know. I know. Um, so and much as to... Donald Rumsfeld once said, the things we know we don't know, and then there are things that we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> so there's there's all of that. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know that we don't know yet. Yeah. Does does the menstrual cycle fluctuation, so hormonal changes throughout the menstrual cycle, does that affect the maybe the threshold to get oh, orgasm? Definitely, yeah. yeah. That's been demonstrated. That, right. Yeah. Uh, the thresholds change with uh, the menstrual cycle. Yeah, with yeah. it being more, <clears throat> presumably more, the threshold is lower around ovulation. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, all right. Yeah, definitely there are estrogen... Uh, sensitive neurons in the spinal cord and in the brain that's well documented yeah and it, it changed the thresholds do you think is important for people to know that is often um mis misinformed or you know sort of propagated as which is actually mythical there's a so-called hard question which is uh we we don't really know what how neurons produce pain or pleasure uh, you know this is the big the hard question is how does and this is what started me in my in my career when yeah. i was in college asking myself um i want to know how does a neuron produce a bit of awareness what is awareness how does a neuron produce it and <clears throat> uh there's no real answer to this no there are there are you know what 50,000 neuroscientists in the world more uh, now and f for human history nobody knows there's no testable hypothesis I mean I've I published a paper recently my my theoretical my theoretical paper of how neurons produce consciousness 
I mean, I have a theory of it. Yeah. But it's hard to test it. That is really tough. Um, but, you know, we have no idea of what is the difference between pain and pleasure. What is the difference in what are the neurons doing that produce pain versus what is pleasure to a neuron? What is, what is pain to a neuron? You know, we just when, know there are certain fibers when, that are activated, and that's it, no, no, right? But yeah, that's not. We know where where it happens, but right. what's happening? Right. And and you know, um, uh, I, I would just think there was what was I? I was just thinking, um, you know, the psychologists who are doing this mapping. They say, you know, they they find activity. Um, anxiety is is here, and fear is in the amygdala, and and, and anxiety is in the frontal cortex, and, you know things like this. And uh, the you know it's like neurophrenology, phrenology, the old time, you know the bumps on the head. They could tell you know this is a criminal mind if they have a bump over here, and it, you know. Uh, what, so what do you mean? All all the only thing that neurons are capable of doing is firing action potentials right faster slower not at all in different in different patterns it's all morse code they talk in morse code action potentials you know more or fewer faster slower different patterns trains of those you know uh, rapid f slow it's all morse code the whole nervous system nothing else it doesn't, you know, the neurotransmitters, yeah, sure, there's dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin and, and opiates and, and all the opioids and all these different things. Um, but what they do is change the Morse code of neurons. You know, what's, right. what is, the, they're just firing in, that, 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 like that. That's all that neurons are capable of doing. So, um, how does that, so, so you can say, well, you know, dopamine produces pleasure. Okay, but dopamine is just changing the activity of some neurons. Right. And all those neurons are doing is talking in Morse code. So how does the Morse code get converted into pain and pleasure or anxiety or fear or love or? We don't know. Yeah. So I have some ideas about it or desire. You know, mm -hmm. I have some ideas about it. I published it. I can send you the paper. That'd be great. Um, I'd love to read it. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's, it's still called a hard question. It is a hard question. So that's something, you know, what's sexual pleasure? Yeah. Uh, what's sexual pain? You know, we can say it comes from the genitals uh, but and it goes to this part of the brain, but we don't know. Why, then the, then why, why is that stimulation or that particular sensation, those nerve fibers firing, causing pain? We don't know. Yeah, yeah. versus pleasure. Right, right. Uh, so that's, that's something that, you know, is, uh, that's the big, that's the, that's the hard question. It is a hard question. Um, so we end the podcast with a few questions that I ask everybody, and these don't have to be related to your field. They can be. What is something you know now in life that you wish you knew earlier? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? What do I know now that I wish I knew earlier? Love is crucial. Love is the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, human interaction. I've always known that. I mean, thanks to my parents and thanks to my mentors and thanks to my, my thanks to my wife and you know thanks to the people i love and who i love who i love and who love me um that that is the most powerful thing more than anything else it really is um but i've known that yeah and i've tried to live that well it's great so, advice for people who uh who are struggling in that in that area i guess to keep make sure you keep the people you love close to you and show them you love them. Yeah. I think, you know, um, it sounds, it sounds um, uh, narcissistic, but uh, there was a, there's a book, a classical book by Eric Fromm, who was a psychiatrist called The Art of Loving. Mm -hmm. And what he said in the book is that you have to love yourself before you can love other people. So, 
um, you know, appreciate to learn to appreciate yourself. Yes. You know, my wife uh, developed cancer, breast cancer, when she was she was young. She was nursing our second son, mm-hmm. and um, she was twenty nine, and she developed mastitis and developed into into breast cancer, and. Um, And it was a terrible trauma uh, to us. Mm-hmm. And I remember that, and, and I was, uh, you know, it was the middle of, I, I was trying to get promotion. It was, I, was, I was young and, you know, I was assistant professor. I was trying to uh, get grants and write papers and do my research, do my teaching. And then she developed cancer. And it just, th- you know, threw a, a monkey wrench into our lives. Um, and I remember I was walking along the street one one day, and I, a thought came to me that I wish you would die. And I said, "What? I'm a nice guy. How could I have? I love my wife. How could right. I have a horrible thought like that?" Yeah. And I and I I said, "I need to see a psychiatrist." So I. Con- I, my I, my wife was was seeing a psychiatrist because she, to deal with her cancer. Yeah. So I called her her psychiatrist. She recommended me somebody. I went I went to see him. Barry Wood was his name, and um, <clears throat> uh, that's a whole other story, interesting story. But the point is that I started seeing him, and the very first the very first um, session, uh, he said. Uh, how do you feel? How are you feeling? And you know, it's hard for me to—it's hard for me to believe it now that what I said. But it was true because he kept reminding me. So I know I really said it, and I remember saying it. Yeah. I said to him when he said, "How are you feeling?" I said to him, "What's a feeling?" <laughs> and you know. And my and my wife Carrie had told me, you know, uh, at some point in our relationship, because we had been married since we were, I was uh, twenty and she was eighteen and a half when we got married. Uh, and at some point after about ten years of our marriage, she said, uh, and I was so involved in work and you know goal oriented and trying to get a grant and all mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she said, you got to change. And I said, change? How am I supposed to change? What am I supposed to do? She said, I don't know, but you got to change. Yeah. And then when I, you know, when, when, the psych, when I told the, my shrink, what's a feeling? And I didn't know what, I didn't know what he meant. And it took about a year until I of 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 psychotherapy of psych, psych psychiatry yeah to to understand what a feeling is wow so I mean fortunately I learned mm-hmm. and now I understand what feelings are and I I think it's really really crucial to understand what feelings are because you know people who don't have awareness of their feelings uh, you know. Uh, situation of alexithymia and it can lead to all kinds of illnesses and psychosomatic illnesses i you know i've yeah. written theoretical papers about that um so that's something that it would have been good if i knew what a feeling is you know and i i think i was my 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 mother uh, uh knocked it out of me when i was a kid because i remember um, you know, telling her I had a terrible dream last night, and she said, "You shouldn't have. You're a nice boy. You're a nice, intelligent boy. You shouldn't have dreams like that." Oh. You know, what am I supposed to do? You know, <laughs> yeah. she was trying to so protect you. She was trying she, to protect yeah, me. I yeah. mean, she, she, you know, she was, she was good. She yeah. was a good mother. Right, right. She wasn't trying to harm. She you. wasn't trying to harm. She was trying to help me. Yeah. But it's her own limitation. Right. You know, uh, if I, um. You know, I was angry at my teacher for for doing something, um, and she said, "That's a terrible thing. You have to respect your elders. You right. shouldn't have feelings like that. You know, you shouldn't be angry. You know, all these shoulds and yeah. shouldn'ts. Yeah. 
you know, knock it out of me. So, but fortunately, I learned it early enough in my life to affect, like, and it changed, you know, because I was so goal oriented. I wasn't thinking about how I feel about anything. Right. You know, I had to dispel it and just focus on succeeding. Right. So fortunately, when I was in my 20s, I learned, I started learning that it's important to heed your feelings, yeah. not just uh, act according to external expectations. Uh, expectations. Yeah. And goal oriented, you know, in terms of cultural requirements or what we think is our cultural requirements and um direct you know let your what you really want to do direct you yeah. rather than what you think you should be doing yeah and i realize now that that was a source of my strength you know i said you know okay maybe I'll, i'm gonna fail at this because i'm not i'm not getting grants to do the sex research mm -hmm. but this is something that's really important it's it's really intriguing to me and I'm going to do it, you know, and that has guided my research. It has guided my life, you know, just uh, learning to enable my, uh, to be willing to follow my, where my heart tells me to go, mm -hmm. where my feelings tell me to go, that do what I believe is right for me rather than what I think is expected of me. Yeah. That has guided me. And I, you know, I had to lose some kinds of interactions, but I feel like, you know, that has sustained me. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my colleagues have retired. A lot of my former students have retired, <laughs> you know, and a lot of my colleagues have died already. I'm 82 and I'm still going strong because I like what I'm, I, you know, I love what I'm doing. It's really in interesting. And there, there are these burning problems still yes you know we don't know what the hell we're doing well purpose you is know, so important even like, at 82 you, know, you need we, a purpose and you have one yeah I, I you know i'm I, I keep wondering you know should i retire and uh but you know if i retire what am i gonna do sudoku puzzles and shuffleboard <laughs> you know and yeah. this is much more interesting you know getting all kinds of you know going to conferences like this um uh, where people are doing stuff and asking tough questions and you know coming up with some answers and you know uh and doing research you know uh, the one of the expressions about research is um if we knew what we were doing it wouldn't be research yeah you know it'd be practice <laughs> so it's a difference yeah. uh, so we you know sort of blunder along and just but you know i still want to know how the hell does a neuron produce a bit of consciousness <laughs> you know yeah. it's bugging me yeah I think it's a good and question. And it's very impractical to really do anything about that. But, you know, I'm, I still want to get some idea of it before I die. You know, so I'm still, so I'm writing papers, theoretical papers, and maybe it's BS, but at least I'm, uh, I think I'm beginning to understand some little things about how the brain works. So I'm, I'm writing papers about that. At least, you know, it feels good to just express it. Yeah. Maybe right, maybe wrong, but at least it's something that people can shoot down because we have no, there are some no targets or anything. Yeah. For many things, at least you have, if you have a target, you say, well, that's BS. You know, so but what's BS about it? What's 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 the alternative? At least you know maybe it it'll guide some other other crazy ideas. Yeah. Anyway, that's so that's the. I guess, you know, thinking about it, that's the one thing that I, it would have been nice if I knew earlier. Right. Would have alleviated a lot of anxiety and would have helped my relationship with my wife, who subsequently died from the damn cancer. Oh, I'm and, sorry. Uh, yeah, she lived for 11 years. She died when she was just before, just when she turned 40. Oh, wow. It was really terrible. Uh, I'm so sorry. I had to be, then I had to be mother and father to my, to my two sons. Yeah. Um, because they were young when she died, and uh, so that was that was you know taking care of them and taking do, do, taking care of work. It was a, it was a it's been a life, but they're they're both great. Uh, they were on their own and have families and everything. That's good. So that's wonderful. They're both professors. 
Yeah. One, one is uh, Professor Adam is a professor of literature at West wow. Virginia University. Okay. And Kevin is a professor of music at University of Toronto. And uh, so they saw with science to, to and their own man. And, <laughs> but they stayed in so academia. We'll go to the arts, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, do you have any non negotiables, something you have to do every day? Something I have to do every day? Yeah, like a non negotiable, like you have to do it. Yeah, take a leak. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> Is there, um, is there like a life hack or health hack you would share? Something that's really improved your life? Well, I think appreciation from my people I respect. Mm -hmm. Love. Uh, I mean, I love my many of my colleagues, and I feel that they love me. You know, we have that kind of relationship. Yeah. And um, that's so reinforcing. And so, you know, it makes... And, you know, they, I respect them. And um, what's, what's a blast for me is that I feel that I get respect from people who I respect. Mm -hmm. You know, people who I think are really wonderful people and they like me. That's so re rewarding. Yeah. So uh, what, the, what was your question? The health hack, which is, I guess, show your show your show your respect or or your admiration for somebody right that would be your your recommendation well but you asked me like what's a, something that improves your life like a, a hack that you can do a so hack. well sort of, you know i mean it's sort of <laughs> yeah um a pr uh, express your appreciation of people sincere appre you know when you appreciate something that somebody does tell them yeah and they appreciate it um, you know, um, write a comment to somebody uh, who, you know, you, they say something that makes sense to you and, you know, makes you realize something, tell them. And, and they feel very, it's very gratifying to them. I know, you know, if somebody says that to me, it's extremely gratifying. Yeah. If a student said that was, they really enjoyed that lecture. I mean, that's a blast. It is. It really is. You yeah. know, because you never know. It's, and, you know, it's not trivial, not at all trivial. So it's very important to um, tell people that you appreciate them and and get that feeling back. Yeah, it, it's, it really is. And that's a hack. It's a, it's a, it's a it's, you know, it's easy. It is. It's free. It's free. It's easy. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. <laughs> it, and it has a great... Um, rewards it's a very rewarding feeling it is the mutual mutual appreciation yeah and lastly what's one thing you would change about the world if you could <laughs> and there's many there's always many but pick one <laughs> for a realization that war is insane it really is i mean to hurt people is just total insanity and animals don't do it to their own. Yeah. And they only, they only kill animal, other animals to eat, right. to keep to stay alive. But humans kill people, kill kill their own. I mean, it's, it's very rare and abnormal in the animal kingdom for animals to kill their own species. Right. You know, in some in some restricted cases, you know, where where a competitive male kills the the offspring of of a female and you know takes over, right? You know, and that there's just you know an evolutionary um, adaptation for that. You know, there's no right or wrong. It's just something that that they do, but that's very rare. Yeah, but it's. You know, it's the history of humans killing each other. This is insane. It really is. It's in total insanity. Yeah, and to torturing each other, and torturing, doing horrible torturing things torturing to each other. other. Yeah. What? What's that all? It's what's that all about? That's that is, you know, if I could change that, that's what I would change. It, it just it does, stop it from happening. Make, yeah. Don't don't let it happen anymore. Right. Period. We'd save a lot of money in our military spending if that. Oh my God! You know, like the don't world get would me be started a, on military spending. <laughs> the world would be a lot safer, a lot, a lot better. Um, 
Thank you so much. Tell our audience where they can find more information about you. I have a website at Rutgers University, but I haven't updated it. I have to, now I'm going to have to update it. You'll have to. I'll link it in there. I'll link it in our show notes and our description. I haven't done it in, in, in a decade or so. (laughs) You know, the, my, the papers that I cite, they're ancient. So I have to update that, but, but you can, uh, Email me at brk at rutgers.edu. R-U-T-G-E-R-S is Rutgers. And just brk at rutgers.edu. Just send me emails I respond to. And let us know emails. if you're any of the research ideas that we thought about during this, during this talk, you know? Yeah, uh, well. <laughs> well, thank you. This has been truly an honor. Uh, oh, I appreciate you. Oh, and I, 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 I really I appreciate, appreciate you. Yeah. you gave us so much of your time. I could have talked to you for hours, oh, no, I think. No, no, it's my pleasure, um, <laughs> really. Anytime. But thank you Rena. so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode of the Rena Malik MD podcast. If you are enjoying this content, a zero cost free way to support this podcast is by going on YouTube and subscribing to our channel or following us on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a rating or review. If you want to learn more about me, feel free to follow me on social media at Rena Malik MD on most social media platforms. And as always, we're going to take care of yourself because you're worth it.